Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Jewish Policy Center webinar with guest professor Steve H. Hankey. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. I'm going to do a quick introduction of the JPC today and a somewhat longer introduction of our speaker, and then turn the floor over to him. The JPC was founded in 1985 as a 501c3 nonprofit organization providing analysis of foreign and domestic policy by scholars and commentators. You can find our work on our website, jewishpolicycenter.org. That's jewishpolicycenter.org. We support a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, free speech, and intellectual diversity. It's a lot of things for a small organization, but I think they're necessary. I think, and I'm admittedly biased, that our webinar series over the last two and a half years has brought you some outstanding speakers. We've had Mayor Oded Ravivi of Efrat, Lawrence Haas on American bipartisanship, an elusive concept, David Weinberg on President Biden's trip to the Middle East. It was a second appearance for David, who had previously updated us on the Abraham Accords, Stephen Blank on Russia's war in Ukraine, Jonathan Schanzer on Gaza, scholar of Islam Harold Rode on Turkey's determination to Islamize Jerusalem. We've had Ilya Shapiro, Douglas Feit, Mike Duran, Arsene Ostrovsky, Max Abrams, and more. You can find all of them on the website as well, www.jewishpolicycenter.org. Today we're going domestic, inflation, recession, the value of your IRA. They're all taking center stage in America. The price of gas and chicken, the availability of cars, the cost of a mortgage. We know we are in trouble, but why? How did we get here? What are we gonna do about it? Those are questions for our guest, Steve Hankey. If I tell you everything you need to know about him, we will never get to him, so I'm going short. He is professor of applied economics and founder and coordinator of the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He is director of the Troubled Currencies Project at the Cato Institute and a senior fellow at Cato's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Steve is also a member of the Charter Council of the Society of Economic Measurement. Many countries you know suffer from inflation and the results of poor economic policy. And Steve Hankey has been a counselor, an appointee, or a senior advisor to many of those, including Kazakhstan, UAE, Venezuela, and Indonesia. And he played an important role in establishing new currency regimes in Argentina, Estonia, Bulgaria, Bosnia, Ecuador, Lithuania, and Montenegro. He has a number of honorary degrees and academic honors from around the world, and once was named one of the 25 most important people in the world. <clears throat> by World, excuse me, World Trade Magazine. In 2020, Steve Hankey was named a Knight of the Order of the Flag by Albania. There's a wonderful article about it in National Review. You should go look at it. And I'm going to quote from the citation because what he did for Albania, he has done for many others. Citation reads in part, Professor Steve H. Hankey is one of the world's most outstanding scholars and distinguished experts in the field of economics. He has provided significant contributions to the Republic of Albania, where he introduced and implemented the principles of market economy and sound money to the post-communist republic. Professor Hanke has also undertaken important strategic initiatives that have facilitated the integration of Albania into the European and world markets, the integration of Albania into the Balkans, and the establishment of a strategic alliance with the United States. I think we are about to learn a lot. Steve Hankey, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Shoshana. It's great to be with you all today. Um, let, let's put a title on what I'm gonna be talking about. And, and the title will be looking for inflation in all the wrong places. And, and if we start uh, with that as a kickoff, uh, think about, inflation in the United States, it's uh, the number one problem facing the United States. 
if you read the polling data, uh, it's right up on top of the list, the most important thing. And why? Because inflation actually is at a 40 year high at 9.1%, the consumer price index, the last reading. And all we've had really since COVID started and, and eventually we had a big increase in inflation in the United States, we've had a barrage of ad hoc reasons for the inflation. And the ad hoc reasons re, uh, start with supply chain. You're, you're still reading about the supply chain problems. That's the, that supposedly causes inflation. No, it causes the changes in the relative price of different goods and services, but it doesn't cause inflation. Then we had, of course, the oil price moving up. Now that is a relative price increase. Oil prices have moved up relative to everything else. If you look at the list of prices, we end up with natural gas uh, going up uh, the most, about 140% year to date, natural gas price increases and gasoline has gone up about 40% uh, and crude oil has gone up about 27%. But then there, there are things that have fallen. Copper has fallen about 25%. So those are relative price changes. Some go up, some go down. But the ad hoc reasoning is all in this grab bag of relative price changes uh, going on in the economy. Then, of course, the, the most absurd thing we had, even the president keeps repeating that, that Putin is causing the inflation problems in the United States, or Putin doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, but then we remember we had the fact that this was supposed to be a transitory thing. All, all these ad hoc things would go away. The supply chains would get fixed. And when they got fixed, inflation would disappear because the supply chains were causing the problem. Well, that turned out to be the transitory period lasted quite a while and it's still going on. So it, it's not transitory. It is not caused by these ad hoc reasons. And by the way, it's not global. A lot of people, they also throw in global. This, this is a global problem. No, inflations are always local. They're not global. So what, are, what does cause the inflation? And, and by the way, the, the local versus global, just to put this into context, we have had the same supply chain problems, if not worse in Japan and China than in the United States. The, the, the war in the Ukraine has affected every, everyone, uh, it, but how about Japan and China? What are the inflation rates? They're 2.5%, ours is 9.1%. So, so this global thing, you can, you can trash that too. It's, it's a lot of rubbish. So what causes inflation? <laughs> Let's get to the real cause. The, the one and only cause of inflation are increases in the money supply and excess creation of money in the system, more money than is required to fuel GDP growth and, and accommodate the increased demand for money that people have when the economy gets, uh, grows and is larger. So how does that work? So you, you increase the quantity of money and we're using now the quantity theory of money. And, and the, the, this has been around since the 16th century and, and the most recent and notable personality that embraced and developed the quantity theory of money is Milton Friedman. So keep that in mind. Friedman is joined at the hip with the quantity theory of money. In fact, his California license plate on, a, on his Cadillac read MV equals PY. M is the money supply, V is the velocity, equals P, the price level, and Y the real rate of growth in the economy. That, that, that is the quantity theory of money or what's called the equation of exchange. It's an identity 
but Milton had it on his on his license plates. Now, as it turned out, by the way, he he, he was a real joker, uh, just a great guy all the way around. So Milton. That it was illegal to have a custom made license plate with MV equals PY, but Milton modified his license plate. He took a black electrician's tape and put the equal sign on and the highway, uh, California Highway Patrol kept <laughs> picking him up. And, and of course he had the faint, the, excuse me, he says, oh, those damn neighbor kids keep putting tape on my license plate. So, so at any rate, it gives you a little flavor for Milton, uh, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But how does the quantity theory of money work? The basics are, if you increase the quantity of money, the first thing that happens is that asset prices go up with a lag of about one to nine months. And N, we had a huge increase in the money supply that started in March of 2020, when, when the pandemic hit, the, the Fed put their foot to the floor and started increasing the money supply very rapidly. So with a lag of about one to nine months, asset prices went up and that's when you saw, what, what does this mean? Well, the stock market boomed, remember? <laughs> the money supply starts increasing tremendously. The stock market moves up, real estate prices go up, any hard assets start, started going up. Then the next thing that happens with a lag of about six to 18 months after the money supply starts being goosed is that you get real economic activity picks up. And remember the economy got very hot and, and was growing at a very rapid rate at, with, with this lag of about six to 18 months after the money supply that went up. And then with the, the final thing, and what we're talking about today is inflation hits, but that's with a long and variable lag of about 12 to 24 months after the money supply injection goes into the system. So the best way to think about this, I think, I think the simplest way is to think of a monetary bathtub. And, and this, John Greenwood and I have wor worked on this. John is the one I, that collaborates with me on, on working on these monetary and the quantity theory of money problems. And by the way, a year ago, John and I wrote in the Wall Street Journal on July 20th, 2021, that inflation would end up at six and maybe as high as 9%. It's 9.1% right now. We, we, hit the, we hit the bullseye with the equation of exchange, MV equals PY, which in fact, in macroeconomics is really the theory of everything. The, the equation of exchange is, it, it, obviously if you know how to use it. So the proof of the pudding is in that article that we wrote where as far as I know, we were the only ones to actually ever put a number on where inflation was going to go and, and, and get it right. There were others that were warning that inflation would be a problem, but they were using uh, other theories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they never really put a number down. We, we actually put a number down. So let's talk about the bathtub. So think of a bathtub and, and you, you have the faucet with money coming into the tub through the faucet. And that's, that's the money supply. And that has increased by 41% since February of 2020, since the pandemic. So you had this huge injection of money into the tub. Now there are two drains in the tub. One, I, I already alluded to both of these. One is the drain that uses money to fuel real growth in the economy. And so that's, that's one drain. The other drain is one that accommodates the increased demand for money as the economy's growing. People want more money in, in their money market accounts and in their savings deposits and so forth and so on. So if you, if you drain out the money that accommodates real economic growth, 
and the increased demand for money, you still have a lot left in the tub. A lot of money is left in the tub. Roughly about 28% 28, uh, 28 increase since February of 2020 is actually left in the tub. And that eventually goes out in the inflation overflow valve. And that's with this lag of 12 to 24 months. And so that's, that's what we're seeing. And that's why we've had this persistency. Now, where, where are we going, going forward? So, okay, Greenwood and I hit the bullseye last year, we between six and 9%, now it's 9.1%. If you go, use the quantity theory of money and the equation of exchange, make all the assumptions that John and I have had to do, we, we're, we're ending up with inflation that will be persistent and be between about five and 8% through 2023 going into 2024. So that's the forecast going forward. And by the way, at the end of this year, it, it's almost inconceivable that the inflation rate would be, it's gonna be between seven and 8%. And, and it'll probably gradually go down depending again on what the Fed actually, actually does. Uh, but that's where, that's where we're at on the inflation picture. The inflation has to come out of the tub. It's already in the tub. And, and, and it will come out, and that's why it's persistent, no matter what the Fed does. So what has the Fed been doing? What's been going on with the money supply? This M figure in the MV equals PY. Right now, we've had three months of, on an annualized basis, negative growth in the broadest measure of money measured by the Fed, which is M2. Now, that, that happens to be bad news because that means that in fact, the economy, we already know it is slowing down, but it means we will probably, with a high probability, maybe 70% probability, enter a recession later this year or early next year. So we'll have this combination of this excess money coming out of the bathtub, creating the inflationary persistency and at the same time, we're, we're, we're gonna have a, a big economic slowdown with, with some negative numbers continuing in the, in the picture. So, so that's, that's, where we, that's where we are. Now, let me, I, I've taken, I, I think Shoshana, probably about as much time as you want me to take. <laughs> let me just mention one thing, and that is the markets, don't see the thing the way that John Greenwood and I see it. They actually have bought into to this ad hocery and, and, and press spin coming out of the Fed and Washington that this is a temporary thing that will eventually go away. And, the, and, and by the way, the Fed knows how to control this and they, they just turn the switch and bang, inflation is solved. No, that's not the way it works, but the, but the markets, the markets, what do they think? And what's priced into the market for the next two years? The market is priced in inflation averaging about 3.2%, which is, which is more or less half of what Greenwood and I think it's going to be. And remember, using the tried and true quantity theory of money, we got it right the first time. And I think there's a pretty good chance we've got it right this time meaning the markets are way off base. There'll be a big mispricing. There'll be a, a big repricing in the bond market, a lot of turmoil in the bond market, which will uh, slop over into the, into the stock market. So we're gonna see a continued increased volatility in the financial markets in the United States. Well, the question is, what, why did everybody miss this thing? I mean, Greenwood and I got it right, okay, fine. But why did everybody else get it wrong? Why were they off the reservation? They're off the reservation because they don't adhere to the quantity theory of money. They, they use something called generally, and you can get, you have to get a pencil and paper out for this, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. That's what the macroeconomists have been using for 30 years. And, and they've pushed the quantity theory of money off to the side. 
the, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models don't even include money. Now, how, how you can have a macroeconomic model without money in it is, is kind of a head scratcher for me, but that's what they use. So there's a modeling problem. There is also, I think, a big political problem and, and a political bias that's in the picture. If you look at the ideology of the Fed staffers, they have 785 economists working in the Fed system. None, none, none of them got the inflation thing right, by the way. They were all on team temporary, all of them completely wrong. 416 of those economists actually work in Washington at headquarters at the Fed. They, they of course, didn't, didn't get it right. Now, as it turns out, what are the, what's the political affiliation of those staffers? The ratio of Democrats to Republicans is 48.5 to one. So, and, 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 and the Republicans, by the way, are the old timers <laughs> that are about ready to retire. So essentially all, all, the, all the young people at the Fed on the staff who are economists, virtually all of them are, uh, are, are Democrats. Now, why is that important? That, this comes back to Milton Friedman. Friedman is, as you know, the big champion of free markets, uh, li liberal economics, and in the European sense anyway, um, and was a very effective advocate, kind of carrying the flag for a lot of the things that Shoshana was talking about in, in her introduction when she said free trade, small governments, free markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that, that's Milton Friedman. And he's so important that President Biden actually said, that this is on the record, Milton, he, and he was proud of this. He said, Milton Friedman isn't running the show anymore. <laughs> we got that from the president of the United States, if you can imagine. So if you're getting the picture, they, they want Milton Friedman or anything attached to Milton Friedman out of the picture. So that's, in, that's part of it. Now, what about the quantity theory itself? If you look at testimony by uh, the chairman of the Fed, Jerome Powell, he has actually said in testimony that we have to unlearn the quantity theory of money. So, so this is kind of the wind up of why, why every, the quantity theory is out, not even used by most people. And of course, that's why virtually no one except Greenwood and myself got the thing right in the first place. Now, if you read the press, there's something I call Hankey's 95% rule. And, and the 95% rule is that 95% of whatever you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant. So everything you're reading about the press, with the exception of maybe 5% at most, is either wrong or irrelevant. And I think with that, uh, Shoshana, I will end my little introduction, which it turned out to be longer than it probably should have been, but that's it. It wasn't longer than it should be, Steve, because I think this is an enormous a learning moment for a lot of people in the United States. And an awful lot of people have not seen or don't remember Jimmy Carter's inflation in the late 70s. So no, it wasn't too long. I think it was great and important. So we do have questions. Um, yeah, on, on the Jimmy Carter thing, this, 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 this actually is important. So in the late 70s in the United States, we, we had an inflation problem. And uh, Jimmy Carter appointed Paul Volcker as the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And, and it turned out that Paul Volcker, who, who was a, actually a good friend of mine, was a monetarist. And, and he adhered to the quantity theory of money, a la Milton Friedman. And, and Ronald Reagan, when he became president, told Volcker, go for it. You're, get rid of the inflation. That, that's on my agenda. I'm not going to interfere with you. you. You take care of it. And he did take care of it. But, but that, that, that was probably, by the way, the last chairman who was an advocate uh, and an open 
openly embrace the quantity theory of money, the MV equals PY kind of thing, that identity day I told you about. So, so we've, kind of, we've, we've lost that. And now we have a chairman who, who openly, <laughs> openly tells us we have to unlearn the quantity theory of money. So we need Ronald Reagan. There are many reasons to want Ronald Reagan back. That might be one of them. Um, as you were talking, you mentioned that we could find ourselves in a recession as we go forward. Are we in a recession now? That was the big argument between two quarters of negative growth. Are we there or are we not there? Okay, let me let me give you my take on this thing. We, the, the facts are we've had two quarters of negative growth in, uh, in, in the U.S. economy and, and those there, there's still revisions that will be coming. So I, I, we don't know if at the end of the day they will end up being revised up or down or whatever. We, we just know at present that's a, that, that is a fact. Now, back to Ronald Reagan. I can't imagine Reagan's advisors, and I, and I was uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors and advising Reagan, I can't imagine his advisors advising him to wade into this stupid rhetorical debate about are we in a recession or not or in a recession or how do you define a recession, all this stuff that's going on now. And Reagan, by the way, Reagan was very sound in principles of economics and, and I can't imagine even if he'd been told to wade into the quicksand of that definition, I, I can't imagine him doing it. I, it's the stupidest thing that the White House has done because they've just shined a spotlight on the economy and have everybody talking about, oh, are we in a recession, not in a recession? I tend to go with the National Bureau of Economic Research. And, and the Business Cycle Committee at the National Bureau of Economic Research, that they define recessions as recessions are used in, in, by custom and practice in the scholarly literature. And since I'm engaged in scholarship, I'll just wait till the NBER in, in a year, they, they decide whether, whether we have had a recession or not. I know we, we're slowing down and end John Greenwood and I think that by late this year or early next year, we will have enough of a slowdown so the National Bureau of Economic Research will, will flag it as a recession. So, so two points here. It's kind of a waste of time defining is it or isn't it. It's defined various ways by various groups. I, I go with the NBER. Which, by the way, the White House is actually trying to, to get out of the problem by going with say, oh, you have to wait, wait for the NBER. But the but, but the main point is the stupidity of the White House and the incompetence of getting involved in this kind of rhetorical back and forth is just beyond me. I, I can't. I, it, it just shows incompetence and lack of any kind of judgment whatsoever. So we have a practical listener who writes, where did she go? Okay, um, what, would, what should we want to see from the government at this point in time? And what do you recommend middle-class families and younger people do now to improve their financial security? Okay, what, 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 what I would hope the Fed would do would get the money supply. Number one, they have to start watching the money supply, which they're not. Remember, Powell has said, we want to unlearn that there's any relationship between the money supply and inflation. So they're not looking at the money supply. So the first thing, they're, they're flying blind. They're in an airplane with an altimeter that should have money on it, and, and there's nothing on it. So that's a dangerous thing. And, and it's very dangerous right now because the money supply actually, before the Fed even started their so-called tightening, the money supply is actually sh shrinking, e even before they started tightening, which suggests that they're probably going to overdo it. 
and 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 not get the money supply up where it should be. And where should it be? It should be at the golden growth rate level. And that is a level consistent with the Fed hitting eventually, eventually, after all this excess money comes out of the bathtub and everything, eventually, and, and maybe 2024 hitting its inflation target of six per, uh, of two percent, the golden growth rate would have to be six. Now it's negative 1.3 on an annualized basis. So, and what was it? What was it when we had the inflation? It averaged since February 2020 until May of this year. The average rate of growth was a little over 16 percent per annum. That's three times higher almost than the golden growth rate of 6%, five or 6%. And now it, it's collapsed and it's negative. So they have to get this thing, uh, the ship steadied at, at about five or 6% growth rate in M2. That, so that's what, that's what they should be doing. Now to protect yourself, uh, number one, uh, you, you shouldn't have any nominal bonds, what, are, what, are, what we normally just call bonds, but nominal bonds, normal bonds of, of any kind, because the inflation rate will be higher than the price expectations that are factored into the bond market right now. So the bond market's gonna get killed. Sometime in the next two years, there'll be, there'll be a lot of blood on the street in the bond market and that, will slop over into the stock market. And how that works is that the, the, the multiples, the price earnings ratios will, will come down as interest rates go up and interest rates go up, why? Because if the price of bonds goes down, there's an inverse relationship between the price of bonds going down and the interest rate going up. And when the interest rate goes up in the bond market, the price earnings ratios come down in the stock market. So, so no matter what the earnings are ha ha happening with various companies and, and the market in general, the, the, the mul so-called multiples will come down and the stock market will stay under pressure. So make certain you have, you have good solid companies that, you know, that you've hopefully bought at reasonable prices and, because, by the way, in, in a growing economy, over the long run, you, you want to be invested in stocks. So, so I, you, you don't want to you don't want to poo poo stocks. You you want you want to obviously pick good companies and so forth. But, but the market in general, you should be exposed to in, in a, on a sustained basis in a growing economy because the rates of return adjusted for risk are higher in the stock market than any other alternative investment class. So, so what kinds of bonds, by the way, might, might you, if you want, let's say, let's say you want cash and you want liquidity. There's something called treasury inflation protected securities, TIPS, they call them. And, and you, you, want, you want TIPS because those are linked and indexed to changes in inflation. So, you, so you're not gonna have the real value of those tips not knocked away because of an, an inflation tax. With, with tips, there is no inflation tax. They're, they're called linkers sometimes. And you get, you, you get these, the United States, the UK, Israel, they, they all have these inflation protected type bonds. And, and for small, it, unfortunately, you can't do it for a large amount of money. I, I can't remember the limit exactly. It's a t tiny amount, like 85,000 or something like that. Something called I-bonds, they're, they're also protected and the rate of return is actually quite high. But, but the amount you can invest is quite limited. So at any rate, that, and hold on to your house. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's that's going to keep going up in value, and 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 that's about it. Without, I, I don't like to get into these conversations with recommending things without knowing the person, seeing their portfolio, talking to them about their objectives and everything. So I'm I'm giving you some things that really thirty thousand feet that are that are 
going to happen and, and safe and so forth, but but it, it, it isn't it isn't the kind of detail, sharp pencil, fine tuning of a portfolio that one would do. It's just kind of general advice. Well, but it's helpful because we all have to look at then our own personal positions, but you've given us some things to think about as we do that. We had someone write in and ask the question. President Biden has, of course, blamed the Russians for the price of gasoline in the United States, but he asked if we produce more energy, gas and oil, and become energy independent as we were a couple of years ago, wouldn't the price of getting goods to market go down? Uh, transportation costs would go down, other things would go down if we were pumping our own oil and producing our own as we had for a little while. Well, it, that have okay, an impact on inflation. Okay, okay. So, so the first the first point that I'd like to raise is is related to the, the sanctions on Russia. These these are, um, I, I, I'm opposed to all sanctions at all times on all, all countries. And, and the reason for this is, again, sanctions in principle are contrary to free trade and I'm a free trader. So that, that, that's point number one, that's a principle. Now, a practical thing is that sanctions don't work. We have a long history of the use of sanctions and, and these things create a lot of unintended consequences and, and uh, there's a lot of blowback and, and, and usually almost, almost 100%, by the way, we find that the targets that are targeted with sanctions end up staying in place. We, 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 we don't change regimes, we, we don't change their behavior. If you target somebody with sanctions, you don't change their behavior. In fact, you create what's called a rally around the flag effect. And usually the targeted state or, or group or individuals or administration, they, they actually get support. And, and, and that, that actually has happened with Putin and, and Russia. They have done a lot of damage in Russia, but much, much more damage in Europe and, and around the world. So the sanctions are, are really for losers. And this is, if you, if you read the scholarly literature, you will find out that sanctions really are for losers or they're, they're a very dumb thing to do uh, be, because there's ne ne never any success associated with them and, and, and usually a lot of negative fallout. The, the simplest one for me is, is something of uh, Nobelist Bob Mundell, an, another good friend of mine, and he, he was a colleague at Chicago for a while with Milton Friedman. Mundell came up with something called the Afghan effect. Now, what, what's the Afghan effect? In 1979, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and, and immediately uh, Brzezinski was a national security advisor for Carter, President Carter at the time, and, and he said, oh, we, we have to sanction the Soviet Union, punish them. And what was the punishment? The punishment was that the US put a ban on the export of grain from the United States to the Soviet Union. And what did the Soviet Union do? They turned around immediately and cut a deal with Argentina at, at good prices, by the way, to replace all the grain that could not be shipped from the United States to the Soviet Union. This, this was a, a complete disaster, the Afghan effect. In, in a, the, the Afghan effect is you do something in a small little place, no one even knows anything about it at the time, Afghanistan, no one even knew where it was hardly. And, and it has all kinds of ripple effects all over the world. What were they? The U.S. farmers were mad as hell because they, they couldn't export their grain. And, and of course, that's precisely why Carter didn't win the second term presidency because the primaries begin where? In Iowa. <laughs> farmers are in Iowa. They, they were mad as hell because they couldn't export their soybeans and corn. Now, go down to Argentina, what about them? Who, they had a boom, a huge economic boom. Who was in power there? The military junta, the, the enemies of the United States got, got a huge gift because the US put sanctions on the Soviet Union. 
So that's the Afghan effect, the, these unintended consequences of sanctions. It's a little example, it's very clear. People can remember what was going on then. So, so, so that's the start of the story. We, we, the, the sanctions have disrupted the international energy market tremendously. And, and by the way, we, we know the, the huge damage is, is going to be in Germany, by the way. The, this, the massive, massive damage in, in Germany because they've, they've cut off Nord Stream 2 completely and, and Nord Stream 1, the, they're running at 20% of capacity right now. So Germany is basically a chemical factory and a car factory. That, that's, that's what happens in Germany. So you're cutting off natural gas and, and this, this is going to be, it's gonna hollow out Germany. The, the damage that's being done in Germany is, is, is incalculable. Everything is changing there. So what about now we get to the US? You said, well, what about the US? What if we went back to kind of Trump years and boom and, 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 and shale and energy production, independence? That has an effect. But remember, prices of oil and natural gas are determined on international markets. Not, not, they're not just a domestic market. It's an international market. So if you increase the supply, what, what, what happens? If everything else is constant, the price is going to be going down a little bit in the international market. So that would be the effect. So, so I, it, this has been kind of a long a long answer getting into sanctions uh, the, the sanctions are for losers uh, and and I probably a lot of people on this uh, session today are are interested in sanctions in various other places besides Russia but they 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 just don't work the history is they do not work they do not change the behavior of targeted parties there's almost no case study that indicates success. So, so they're just as a practical thing, they're, they're stupid. As a principal thing, I, I think they're bad <laughs> as a free trader. As a practical thing, I think they're just stupid. And, and that's where we are with sanctions disrupting a lot of things, including the energy market big time. And then we get down to this domestic production in the United States. And, and there's no question the current administration, by the way, has, has been at war with the, uh, with, with, with the major oil producers and, as well as miners or any, anyone producing anything except wind power and solar is, is on the kind of hit list, shall we say. So that, so that if, if, if that hit list was dropped, it, it, it would be good in the sense that the supply being produced and put into the market would be greater and prices would be lower. So that would be good. Right. So we did have a couple of people uh, note that in the case of Iran and sanctions on the Iranian government, although the government is entrenched now as much as it was before, maybe more, I don't even know. Um, but we removed their ability to do some of their damage abroad by uh, constricting their, their foreign currency reserves. And so there was less money for Hezbollah and less money for some of the outside things that Iran did that was bad. And so- Yeah, but, 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 but you, you see, I, I, again, if, if you really, uh, that, that's true. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that. But, but you have to say, then you have to ask a question, Shoshana. Well, what next? That's true. What, what's next? And what's next? They, they enter a, a variety of other nefarious activities as a result of this blockage. So, and, and, and you have, by the way, whether it's North Korea, Venezuela, Iran, Russia, you, you have international mafias developing and black markets developing as a result of these sanctions. In other words, you, you're, you, you have to go beyond the first step. Okay, I agree, the first step. Okay, you freeze somebody's bank account. They don't have as much money in the account to spend. That, that's a no-brainer. 
but then the, the then the question is, well, what next? What what are they going to do next? And and what they're going to do next is maybe even worse than what they were going to do in the first place, because again, you you have all kinds of networks. I mean, the classic one, of course, is is North Korea, and and, and Iran is right in there at second place. By the way, don't. don't they, they, there's always workarounds. There are always workarounds with sanctions, always. And, and they're usually worse than, than, than what was happening in, in, in to start. Yeah, although it was pretty bad to start. Okay, so we're coming toward the end of the program. I wanna ask you um, one question, then a kind of uh, final thought. There is something called the Inflation Reduction Act up on the Hill now. Um, I think it's like 10,000 pages in 72 gazillion words, but have you had an opportunity to take a poke at it? And if so, do you, what do you see as the main takeaways from it? It sounds like a tax the rich plan. Well, it, uh, uh, number one, I, uh, it, as you implied, I, I haven't gone through the 10,000 pages. <laughs> no one has. But, no one has. but uh, it, it, the, the, whole, the whole thing, the, starting with the name this has nothing to do with reducing inflation and and it, so that's the first point because why why do i say that because the equation of exchange mv equals py milton friedman's license plate that is the theory of everything when it comes to inflation there, there is no other explanation. So the idea it's going to do anything with inflation is ridiculous. It will change the relative prices of, of different things. Exactly how, I don't know because I haven't gone through the 10,000 page thing. And like, it, it, it looks to me like a, a, it, it's a tax increase bill. Now, if it's a tax increase, is really not the smart, number one, it won't be implemented right away, but that if if that's the case, let's assume that's the case, that, that Shoshana, you and I agree, it's a tax increase bill. That's that's the big bottom line. That is, is an ill-conceived idea to be pushing in the middle of what we think is going to be either now a recession or going to be a recession because that would be a pro-cyclical policy. You, you increase taxes when the economy is going down. That isn't counter-cyclical. That isn't something that smooths things out and makes things worse. So, so, so from, a, from a broad macroeconomic point of view, it, it, it really is a, is a counterproductive kind of thing. And, and, and God only knows what, what are in those 10,000 pages. You know, I, I, I don't even wanna know to tell you the truth. Um, I don't either. Okay, so we've, we're coming to the end of the program and people who tune us in know that I like to end on a positive note. So I try to ask a question, the answer to which is positive. I don't have one of those. So I'm simply gonna to say to you, Steve, do you have any good news with which to leave us. And if you don't, uh, I, 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 I am, um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I do have one positive thing. There are elections coming up. Okay. I, 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 I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a great thing. If, if, if you don't like who's in the, who's running the show now, you're gonna have a chance to vote and, and get somebody else to run the show. But I, the general state of things, by the way, I, I have not uh, been as concerned about the possibility of, uh, shall we say, let's say international confrontations. I, I have never seen anything. <laughs> what, what happens when you stick a, bear in the eye with a stick, the bear tears the hell out of you. That, that's what happens and that's what's going on. And, and, and what we, we do the, exactly the same thing with China. So we have two, two giant states that, that we, we've aggressively riled up. 
well, and, and a number and a, and a number of other smaller ones. I, 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 it's really kind of mind boggling. I, th I think we're in a very dangerous situation globally. I think the geopolitical situation is is fraught with danger right now. That's that's my perspective. And and by the way, this thing with Russia and these sanctions being placed on Russia, it's a suicide pact for Europe. Europe's going down the tubes, completely down the tubes. You wait and see. It's going to really be bad in Europe. And and Europe, they're supposed to be our allies. No. We I uh, yesterday in the New York Times, uh, there was an excellent short article by Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff wrote about the sanctions. I, I commend that letter to you because it is a short statement in three paragraphs that says everything that needs to be said. Jeffrey D. Sachs, New York Times yesterday, read his letter. It's, uh, it's 400 words or something like that. But that that is, I, I, I I completely agree with everything Sachs had in that art in that letter. That that summarizes my thinking on the sanctions in Russia. So people say, "Oh, then what do you do, Hanky? You know, you know, Russia. Those those are bad guys. You know, we got to put sanctions on. We got to do something. They did this, that, and the other thing. And and what you do is what Sachs recommended. You you engage in diplomacy before before they destroy Ukraine." completely and destroy Europe in the process completely and impose huge costs on the United States, get in there with diplomacy and bring this thing to an end. That's what you do. The problem is, and this isn't really very, opt the, the diplomacy is, is optimistic. That's an optimistic note. The, the pessimistic note is that we, we don't have a Talleyrand anymore or Metternich, we, we don't have a Congress of Vienna kind of thing where things get settled. If, if you look at what they were doing in the Congress of Vienna, that's what's called diplomacy. We, we, don't, we don't have uh, all the lightweights running around. They, they hardly know where they're going, let alone what they're gonna say when they get there. So I'm going to go with two things to end the program, aside from thanking you for what I really do believe is a tremendously valuable addition to our education. Um, we don't, we in the Jewish Policy Center don't spend enough time on economics, so thank you. But I'm gonna go with your optimistic thought that we do have elections. We are a country with elections. We can change the course of where we're headed. And that is an optimistic thought. Um, just to say, as I thank you one more time, Steve, somebody just wrote in and said, thank you for reminding us why economics is called the dismal science. Um, <laughs> but in necessary science. And so on behalf of the listeners and on behalf of the people who are going to download this later and watch it, thank you very much for enlightening us, depressing us a little bit, but giving us a good handle on some of the things we need to know. Steve Hagee, thank well, you. Well, th thank you very much for inviting me. It's been great to be with you. Thank you.